Welcome to Fiber Chat. So September is the month of Rowan on Fiber Chat. And today I'm continuing my conversation with Anna Hall, who is the technical design coordinator at Rowan. Hi, Anna. Welcome Thank to my you. channel. Thank you very much for having me. Well, before we start talking about your role at Rowan, let's tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, how did you start knitting? When did you start knitting? So I started knitting... Um, I was taught to knit stitches, not cast on or cast off, when I was a child. Um, but I couldn't really take that anywhere because I didn't know how to start um, an actual project. Um, so I had a continued interest in textiles and crafting in general, but um, that sort of took me through um, sixth form. And, and then I studied a foundation course in uh, art and design. And it was there that I, I thought I was going to study fine arts at university, but I actually found um, textiles and patterns and constructed textiles was really my passion. So at university, uh, I specialised in woven textiles. So again, it's still constructed, but totally different from knitting. So I spent my second and third year on Dobby looms, um, just weaving my days away. It was great. Uh, but you get the same kind of, you're still designing fabrics, you've got to think about the drape um, and the textures. Uh, but actual hand knitting, we were sort of taught again in university, but um, it was after I left that I, it's so much, it's so hard to weave at home. Okay. Um, you can get tabletop looms, but in terms of accessibility, knitting is so much easier. Um, so I taught myself to knit properly again, um, knitted hats, baby clothes, scarves, nothing too complex. Um, but I thought I knew enough. In, in the 10 months after university, I thought I'd learned enough to apply for this job that I found. Um, and I, I learned a lot on the job. Well, I mean, besides just knitting a couple hats and a couple scarves, you, in the meantime, also became a designer because your designs have been published in Rowan Magazine in 73, and I think another one right before that. How did that happen? Um, well, I think my course helped me from university. Obviously, you learn how to work with colour. Um, again, about the drape of the fabric, the handle, the structure of a garment. Um, so my final year project was woven coats, um, so jackets, uh, but you also learn about sustainability. So I special, I think my project was um, trying to make reversible jackets so that you could be worn twice as much, um, but also trying to develop emotional um, attachments to to your clothing and how how can you do that as a as a retailer. Um, so I found that bit really interesting. And I still, I, I, I hope, I, I like to carry that into my designs now, um, making timeless pieces. So, but in terms of getting into knitwear design, that is all pretty much learned on the job. Um, and I must have been here two years maybe, um, when I thought I actually want to try my hand at this. Um, so I wasn't invited to design. I, I just, I had the, the benefit of being in the office um, and just designed a few for a brief and sort of submitted them. Um, you feel like you are a very brave woman in general? <laughs> um, in some respects, when I'm on a climbing wall, like we were talking about, I feel, um, I feel like some people wouldn't want to climb. But in, in terms of my general day to day, no, I wouldn't say I'm particularly brave. Because I feel like it takes some bravery of like going and submitting that first design. At yeah, it may be facing rejection. Yeah, I suppose that. I mean, it's all it's all that sort of saying that nothing good comes if you don't feel uncomfortable doing it. So, although I I didn't feel exactly comfortable submitting work to to a, a project where I know they've already got enough designers, they will have enough design anywhere, and um, you know, in, in that collection anyway. Um, and there is the possibility that I just sort of have a few designs that I never do anything with. Um, there is always that small chance that they might eat, like, you know, just like them, but keep them on side or worst that happens is they say no and, you know, 
luckily they didn't. How did it feel to see that your first design is in Rowan magazine? <laughs> it still feels surreal um, in some respects. So uh, every time I visit London, there's a John Lewis on Oxford Street and they stock Rowan. So uh, um, whoever I'm with, I'm dragging them upstairs into the haberdashery section <laughs> and finding the magazine. This is my design. <laughs> I still do it now. Um, but that first design, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with it, it's a um, cushion. And I wanted to bring that um, woven inspiration in there, uh, in, into my knitwear design. So that, that was supposed to be, it's, it's a cushion, but it was supposed to be a blanket. Um, and that was also a learning curve. It was going to be a Fair Isle and Intarsi blanket. And we sent it to two different knitters who both said, this is way too complex. I've got too many bobbins. It's just actually impossible to knit. Um, so I was like, okay, well, maybe it won't make it. Um, I probably should have done it as knitted squares and then sewn together afterwards. Um, but at this point, it was too late to knit the whole blanket and, and rewrite it. So uh, David likes the fabric anyway. So we thought, okay, we'll we'll make a cushion from the fabric that we had. Um, and that's what we did. Are you concerned with the difficulty, like technical difficulty of design when you come up with a design? Um, yeah, I think I think you've got to play to certain levels as well. So we do have a lot of knitters out there that love knitting Fair Isle. So we have to get those Fair Isle designs into our collections. Um, but then I am always trying to be mindful of um, beginner knitters and introducing people to knitting with a, a nice, easy pattern. I, I think about it a little bit, but I, I do try to design over all those sort of levels. Right. Well, let's talk about what it takes to be a technical design coordinator. Like what does technical design coordinator actually do? So it sort of, it covers um, everything from pattern writing is probably the most important part of it. And that's where it starts ultimately. Um, I do see designs when they come in um, for selection. Uh, they'll be selected by David, Sharon and Lisa. Um, but my my sort of job covers pattern writing, checking, um, all the way through to knitting. Uh, when the patterns are laid out for, for our books, I would also help proofread them which is quite an important part because it's so easy just to lose a little bit of text or um, put the wrong image in uh, because these graphic designers um, aren't so familiar with the patterns. So let's let's just talk a little bit like in more details because I'm fascinated with how Rowan works this way. I talked to Martin's story and he mentioned that he publishes north of 100 patterns per year. So tell me about like, Martin comes up with the idea. Does he sketch it? Does he swatch it? And in what form does it come to you? So Martin um, will design for a brief. So that's the sort of ultimate starting point is we think of um, what kind of collection we want, which yarn we want to be um, focusing on. And then that will go out to say, if, if Martin's doing a brochure, so say um, he's launching a Pebble Island brochure, um, on the 1st of September. Um, so that will go out to him as a brief, sort of what kind of shapes we want, uh, what colours, textures. Um, and then from Martin, he will draw up a sketch. So it's normally a pretty accurate sketch from Martin, but that does vary across designers in the, the way it's drawn out as well. So sometimes it's just a hand-drawn shape, um, but then other other designers might do a full sort of texture detail on the actual um, drawing as well. Um, but then it's always got a knitted swatch uh, as well. So if it's in an existing yarn, we will always use those existing yarns to swatch with. But if it is with a new yarn that's still in development, it might be on the odd occasion that we have to knit with an existing yarn and swatch for tensions after. Um, but Martin's swatches are pretty hefty um, so you get a really good idea of what what he wants in that garment and what it would look like on the final uh, piece 
And then what happens? So you have the swatch and you have the sketch. How does it go from that to becoming an actual pattern? Um, so there's quite a lot involved. So it, it does start off by going back to the designer. So in Martin's case, it would go back uh, down to Devon and he would measure his tensions off of the swatch. Um, we do we do double check those tensions as well, just to make sure they're in line with um, Rowan's stock. Uh, stock and stitch tensions um and he will plan what measurements he wants so everything has to be thought about you know the shoulder width chest width um sleeve length cuff length uh cuff width and but yeah every little detail will be done by the designer um but if we have any issues in pattern writing when it comes to grading in particular um then i would just liaise with the designer and uh and make sure it, it's what the, it's it's um, what the, what the designer wants, but also it will work over uh, our full size range. Right, and Rowan is very size inclusive, right? In their magazine. Yeah, so we uh, increased our size range a year or two ago. It's been a couple of years now. Um, so now we go from I think a twenty eight inch chest to a 62 inch chest um and that is okay for if you know a standard stock and stitch garment but if you have a motif for example it might be that that motif changes its appearance quite a lot you know it could look quite um small on the larger size so in some instances we would make two charts um one for sort of the first half of the size and then one for the second um and then also in some cases we might need to group sizes so it would still cover all of our sizes but it might be that um rather than have nine separate sizes we would have five or six right how many people work on writing the patterns um i have so all our pattern writers are freelancers and we have a couple of main people that we go to um and then maybe two or three more that i could also use, um, but it's not very many really. I think pattern writing and checking um, is a bit of a dying art, unfortunately. Um, and that is something I'm, I'm really trying to do at the moment is find more checkers and writers, particularly writers, um, just to help ease the workflow a little bit. Um, but it is a really maths heavy job. Right. And um, because they're freelance, you know, you're working from home, which is a benefit for some people, I suppose. But you don't get that same interaction with, with the team that I would get at, at the office. Does Rowan have a specific way that the patterns are written? So we have our own style. Um, so we always write, so with crochet patterns, it's always written with UK terms. Um, and we do mention that in the pattern as well. Um, and then when it comes to knitting patterns, we uh, uh, list the millimetre knitting needle size, but then also have US and UK conversions. Um, but we have our, our standard sort of language, um, if you like, that all our patterns are written in. Um, so I can read it super easy now. It's, it's like my first language. Um, but we, we do understand that some knitters who aren't familiar with Rowan might struggle to understand certain aspects. Um, but we do try and make it as understandable as possible whilst also keeping it concise enough so that you can get the most into a brochure. Well, that's my next question, basically, because like if, if you are freelancing, like if you are a designer who just self-publishes their own patterns, right, you can go into as many details as you want. You can write a whole book for just one pattern. But when you're doing it for brochure or for the magazine, you're very limited in space. Does that present a problem like on particularly difficult designs? It does, yeah. Um, so we have to think about design count from the very start because of that reason for, for page counts in, in our brochures. Um, but it's the pattern writer that ultimately decides how a pattern is going to be written, whether it's going to be a chart or written instructions throughout. Um, we don't tend to do both, although that would be ideal. 
because I know that some knitters prefer to just work from a chart, others prefer written instructions. Um, we don't have that um, that choice, unfortunately. So we, we do have to think about space um, and we try and make it as concise. So if it's got a pattern repeat, then we'll put that on the chart so you can blow it up as big as possible. Um, but then with the magazine, we've also got to think about translations and languages. Um, because when you translate a pattern, it quite often gets a little bit longer. Um, and so we've got to think about laying that out in the magazine as well, uh, because it all gets sort of printed at the same time. So it might look in the English if there's like a little strip of blank space. Oh, why is that there? It's probably because in, in the sort of German magazine, for example, there's, there's text there. Right. What was the learning curve for you to learn like all the things you needed for this job? Um, it's been a gradual thing. I think uh, Lisa Richardson was my mentor to begin with. Um, it turns out I was twisting all my stitches as I knitted anything. I was doing knits and pearls the wrong way around. And I'm also a left-handed knitter, so that confuses things. Um, so when I was trying to understand pattern queries, it was quite difficult as I'm used to moving my stitches from the right needle to the left and trying to reverse that in my head was quite difficult. Um, but in terms, I mean, my, my job, I started as design assistant four years ago. Um, so I was helping Lisa. Um, I was still sending out to pattern writers and checkers, um, but I, I sort of look after the deadlines a bit more, the timelines of, of everything um, when it comes to writing, checking, translating. Um, and translations has become a bigger job as well, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> well, let's talk about, like when I'm thinking about pattern writing and checking all of those things, that there's no mistakes, that like everything is as it's supposed to be, especially since you writing based on a sketch and a swatch. That's a lot of pressure. Are you stressed at this job? <laughs> um, most garments are pretty easy because I can send it off to a pattern writer, um, and they they do a, you know most of the work on on our pat on our garments. Um, we do occasionally have the odd garment that might prove a little bit difficult. Um, so I only get stressed if a garment either misses a photo shoot or isn't perfect. I don't get st stressed is the wrong word, but that's that's what I don't like, is if I can't get the whole collection ready, looking great for a photo shoot, then I'm, I'm not happy. Um, Are but, you a perfectionist in general? Like when it comes to your life, is everything has to be perfect? <laughs> Well, in terms of cleanliness, tidiness, maybe that's something else. My desk is not the tidiest place. Um, but when it comes to garments, I am a bit of a perfectionist, yeah. Even, you know, um, up to finishing, sewing up. Um, we've got a great team of finishers now that sew up all our garments, fix anything that needs to be uh, righted. And they do a great job. So I'm happy now that we can have really well sewn up garments because it just changes the whole structure of them. Right. How do you think Rowan has changed you as a knitter, as a designer, or as a person, like in general? Oh, good question. Um, I think as a knitter, I always go for natural fibres now. <laughs> That's probably the biggest change. I wasn't very experienced beforehand anyway. Um, so I think I went for the more affordable yarns because um, I didn't want to spend more money on it. Um, but in I mean, also, uh, like I said before, my stitch, my knitting was not great. Um, so in terms of my actual neatness of, of the garments I create, it's improved massively. Um, but I also think I knit more feral now. I don't think I would have ever touched colour work if it wasn't for Rowan. I probably would have at some point started knitting garments, but I, I would have kept to single colour. Um, and maybe introduce cables, but really, Fairwell is something that I, has grown on me massively. 
Well, you're surrounded by some world-class designers, Citroen. Is that yeah. intimidating to submit your design knowing that like Martin Story's designs or Lisa Richardson designs will go into the same magazine? Or is it inspiring? Uh, I'd say it's inspiring, yeah. I mean, it's it's incredible what these people think of. Um, because sometimes ideas can come to my head really quickly. So I, I was designing last night, actually, my partner um, is saying, how, how do you do this? And I'm like, well, I don't really know. <laughs> it kind of just happens. Um, you know, you get given a brief, so you, you'd have a, um, a, a selection of colours to choose from, whether that's provided or just in general autumnal colourways, for example. Um, so that helps. And, they, you know, you get indications of the shape of the garment, maybe if they're looking for feral or cables. Um, but generally, you can have a bit of a play about, have fun. Um, and most of the time, I can find my own images of something relating to a brief where I, that, that I can pull from. So if it's geometric, then I might look at some Moroccan tiles or if it's um, the Yorkshire countryside, I've got plenty of photos to to pull inspiration from. I mean, where do you find those inspirations? Like you walk on the street to the climbing gym and you see something on the street, you take a picture? Like how does that happen? Um, it's not usually quite so mundane as that. It might be that we're on a big hilly walk and um, the colours in the landscape, especially at autumn time. I just love when it changes all from green to the reds and browns. Um, but geometrics I really love. So I visited Morocco a few years ago and I've still got pictures um, that I was looking back on a few days ago of Moroccan tiles. They're so different, you know, massive um, arrays of tiles. Um, but also buildings, uh, cities I find really inspirational. Georgia Farrell, you probably know that she loves cities and her inspiration is incredible. You know, when you see the original pictures compared to the the knitwear. Um, I love seeing her final designs and see, seeing what they've come from. Right. And she does a lot of play on like shadows. So there is some depth of color in that as well. So it's like really interesting to watch her design. Part. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because you writing the patterns, does that change your design process? Like, are your design submissions different from other designers that throw on submissions? Because you are the one who is writing the patterns, does, are your design submissions different from other designers that throw on? Do you write your own patterns or do you also submit the sketch in the swatch? I also submit the sketch in the swatch because if it's not selected, um, you'd have a pattern that you maybe couldn't use. Um, if it's an accessory, I, I could write the pattern myself, but garments, to be honest, um, grading, I, I'm, I can't do. So I could knit, I've knitted my own garment where, um, I've just written a pattern for my size for, for my own design, but I wouldn't be able to publish it without getting someone else's hands on there to size it up for me. Um, but I, I think my designs are different because I think about, I, I hear from the writers all the time about what they find easy. Um, which patterns might take longer. Um, so some of the designers might submit things where it's a bit of a complex um, construction, for example, that I would maybe stay clear from because I know it's going to cause future me issues. Do people complain ever about your designs? Do you ever hear like negative feedback or is it usually all very positive? Um. I, d I haven't heard any negative feedback. Um, and in design selection, of, of, like um, every designer has designs that don't get chosen. That's just a part of the process. Um, but it might be that you might have to change colours to fit with the rest of the collection. It's, it's really hard to know what everyone else is going to submit. So um, there might be some things that are only decided on design selection when it comes to uh, a colour theme, for example. So there's always things that might be tweaked slightly, but never negative feedback from anywhere, I don't think, luckily. Right. What does it feel to see people knitting your designs? Uh, it feels really great. Um, 
I you was surprised by their color choices. Um, I'm constantly in awe of how different we all are um, in terms of taste. So it's great. I mean, I have a friend who texts me um, saying that she's bought the magazine and she's knitted my Camille vest um, in a bright blue colour. And that was lovely to see. Um, and I've also seen on Instagram someone's knitting my beach bag, which is one of my favourite designs. So I, I do love seeing people knit my designs. Um, and it's nice when people knit them in the original colour because you think, OK, well, I've made a good choice. Clearly people like it. But I also like to see people play around with, you know, make a design a bit more personal to them. What's your favourite thing about working at Rowan? Oh, I've got a few favourite things. Um, I love the team that I work with. We are quite a small team, so really closely, um, you know, tight-knit tight, tight knit team. Um, but I also love the fact that I get to play with yarn um, and knit all the time. Not all the time, I'm exaggerating. Um, but I think uh, one thing that surprises me is that my love for maths, I didn't know I had. Um but if you if you give me a good spreadsheet, I'll be happy. I've got a spreadsheet going on at the moment trying to work out yarn amounts because we only get one one garment knitted. We then have to accurately work out the yarn requirements for every size. Um, and the way we do that at the moment is we have a pad form that is filled out by our checkers with all the measurements for every size. And we fill it in, uh, we input it on this really old piece of software that doesn't recognize a mouse it literally uses like numbers and enter button so it takes quite a while to work out the yarn amounts um and trying to create a spreadsheet to do that for us that will be so much easier i'm loving it because i can just have my head in a spreadsheet <laughs> is there anything frustrating about working at rowan like i know when i talked to georgia she was saying that sometimes because the design takes like 18 months to be published between the moment of like the design idea and it's being published in the magazine that sometimes she forgets what she designed and she's like, oh, is that mine? You know, <laughs> do you have any frustration with like timelines or any or or deadlines? Yeah, I would say um, just one thing that comes to mind is stock issues. So like um, if we launch a spring summer season because we normally work a year ahead. So if we've launched, like just launched um, a spring summer season that uses something like DK Seashell, then that sells really, really well, which is great for us. But then we might want some of that to knit our samples for the next um, spring summer. And it's then that that gets a bit complex because if it's a multicolored design, you can't just replace it with any any shade. It's got to be thought about and it's got to go back to the designer um so that is sometimes a bit frustrating trying to get that to fit into the timelines because you don't want to you know uh photograph too late you've got to get it all ready Al although it's still nine to twelve months in advance it's got to go out to the sales force and lots of things that i don't see um but i know it's got to be done for um but generally i think I don't have too much stress here, too, too many things to worry about. Well, when you decided to apply to Rowan for job, you probably had some image in your head of what it's going to look like. What's the most surprising thing for you that you didn't pre uh, saw coming and you didn't think is going to be part of your responsibilities? Um, that's a good question. I would probably say translations. That's grown quite a lot since I've been here. Um, when I applied for this job, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, not in a bad way. I just, it's a job that I never knew existed. Um, so it was news to me, you know, when you think, oh, how do these garments get knitted? They're all hand knitted. Someone does it in four weeks for a garment. That amazes me. Um, so there was lots of things that I didn't, know about um but it's been it's been great you know learning all these things um and translations like i was saying was has grown massively i did start i think i must have been sending them out pretty close to when i first started um but we just keep on 
growing and growing, which is great, and increasing the number of languages that we're translating into. So I think I started with French and German, and now we're up to um, five or six languages, maybe more. I think I'm doing myself a disservice. It might be more like eight, including English. Were you participating in the 74? Magazine 74? No, I wasn't, no. Um, the only design I've got this season is um, the Kitzel Kay's accessory design. I think it's called Ultraviolet, and it's made the cover of the brochure incredibly. Um, so I was super happy with that. And that is another brochure that I'll be taking my parents into John Lewis or a local yarn store to <laughs> show them. <laughs> Do you have a favourite yarn to knit this? Favourite yarn, I I don't have one favourite. I have a few that have surprised me. I think hand-knit cotton, um, when I started swatching for Mag 71, I was surprised with how much I loved that, to be honest. Uh, it's a really underrated yarn, um, super affordable. Uh, so that's one of my favourites because it's got a great colour choice as well. Um, but I do love Alpaca Classic, Kid Classic, Kids Look Haze. Like, honestly, I, I couldn't choose. <laughs> oh, if I had to, I'd probably spend hours thinking, and oh, maybe Alpaca Classic. <laughs> what do you like about Alpaca Classic? It's really lightweight. The colour selection, again, is great. Um it's just really nice to knit with, I think. Um, but I mean, Al Alpaca Soft is, has got great stitch definition as well. There, there are so many great yarns. I just, yeah, I can't choose. Well, you mentioned that you had an idea for design last night. How many designs do you do now? And do you see yourself going for 100 designs a year? <laughs> um, well, to be honest, I like my job so I don't think I would be able to go full-time designer if, if that opportunity ever um, arrived I mean maybe I could if 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 it was uh still still working from the office every now and then but I do like being with the team um but we're at the moment designing for autumn winter 2024 so I've got two design briefs I'm, I'm, I'm designing for um, and they are, um, actually, I don't know if I can tell you, I'm going to keep them secret. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we're using, uh, felted tweed, alpaca classic and alpaca soft and some Mordale yarn as well. So it's really exciting. I, I sort of design maybe four, five for the main mag. It'll be less this time. Um, cause I'm going on holiday. <laughs> so, um, and then two for the, for the, uh, Mordale brochure. When people think about Rowan Yarns, because it has such a global presence, basically, in stores everywhere, and a lot of people see all the publications by Rowan, people think it's this, like, faceless, huge corporation where nobody is actually, like, responsible, like, few responsible for making decisions. Tell me about the Rowan team. What does it feel like? Yeah, it does feel like um, our brand presence does, it's a lot bigger than the size of our team. Um, because we use a lot of freelancers, not just in pattern writing and checking, but um, all aspects. And we also have a few team members that work from home. But the internal team is really quite small. Um, and, you'll, you'll, you know, people will email them with queries and expect an answer straight away. And it's just, it's not possible. So it, it's a bit um, frustrating at times. But I understand that with, with a big brand, you kind of, you, you want your answers quick. I um, I do empathise with knitters. Um, but we are such a small team. And it's great in a way because you get to do a lot more. There's so much diversity um, in our day-to-day -day jobs. You know, you're not just sat doing one job and one job only. You get to help each other. Um, and you also get to see different areas of the business. So obviously my my knowledge is with the design room, but I also talk to the marketing team quite a lot. So I know where everything is at, and it's nice to see um, a design go from the start right through the whole process to the very end. 
So, yeah, it's, it's good that we're such a small team. I do like it. I was actually like very surprised myself to learn that because I imagined Rowan to be huge and to see David McLeod answer my text in the on Instagram, I was like blown away when it was he who actually talked to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, David um, well, is really passionate, obviously, and, and touches every part of um, the business as well including you know he we, we all keep up with what people are saying on social media um so which is good but also you do see the bad as well are you happy at Rowan? yeah i'm happy at Rowan. <laughs> yeah i mean um there's there's lots to keep me busy um and i get the design side of things as well so i get the fun section um but also maths and I also get to talk to people liaise with my um freelancers so it's a it's a fun job yeah well before I let you go can we talk a little bit about your climbing does that interfere with your knitting how do you find time to do both (laughs) um uh, funny story I have actually got a video of me knitting a swatch on the climbing wall um, at my partner's bouldering wall. So I've climbed up um, with the knitting needles in my mouth um, and then sort of stuck myself, I've, I've, I've wedged myself in, in a chimney um, and knitted a swatch um, for the video, no other reason really. Um, Please don't try it at home. <laughs> <laughs> don't try this at home. <laughs> it's a stupid idea. I just wanted to do it because it's fun. Um, but I mean, really, I, um, in terms of climbing and knitting, I do take my knitting with me when we climb outdoors. So I sometimes knit in the car, but I, it does make you travel sick and it's not the best thing to do. Uh, but if I, if I can, if it's a smooth ride, I'll do it. Um, but then also at the crag, um, if it's bouldering, I can knit because you don't have to belay anyone if we're, um, rope climbing out there's there's no chance you can safely knit right. and play someone at the same time <laughs> well there's probably also some downtime between the climbs when you can just sit relax and knit and watch others exactly yeah i think when it's um winter is when i knit the most so during summer i sort of put it down most of the time i'll focus on climbing then um but then during the winter that's when I can take my knitting needles with me. I'll knit sometimes in a cafe if I'm waiting for my coffee. Um, in the car, like I said, at the crag, just as long as my hands don't get too cold, that is the issue in the winter because I can't knit with gloves on. So, Well, now that you are a designer, do you need other people's patterns? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, <laughs> in fact, I knit... Um, well, I, I get some garments from... Rowan, so some old X display garments. Um, that's one of the perks of the job is we're able to take them home. Um, but I do still knit other people's designs, and it might be that I knit um indie designers patterns with Rowan yarns. Um, and it's actually quite good to learn how other people write their patterns. Um, because like you said earlier, they are really um diverse in the way that they're written and they do explain a lot you know they'll go into detail about techniques so it's great to kind of take information take inspiration as well from these patterns and see okay what what can we take into our own patterns that might be able to help knitters learn well i want to thank you today for being my guest because i've learned so much about raw and inside information that i had no idea how that was happening so i'm glad you agreed to this interview and it was, it was fun to chat with you about all the things knitting and climbing because, as I told you before, my son is a passionate uh, climber. So I was... Yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? But no, it's, it's been really good to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Anna.